Compass Publishing. Yes, I can. Okay. So, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is going to be an interesting event. It's going to be about all kinds of things we're about to do. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Roger Fusselman. It's a very hard name to say. I have trouble saying it myself. And basically what I do is I've been in Korea for maybe 20-ish years. I'm an English teacher. I've helped out with Compass at publishing on a few things. I'm here to talk about a few topics. And those topics are going to be very important for your teaching. And so a lot of what we're going to do today is we'll talk a little bit about this. We're about to, I'll, I'm going to announce the topic soon. But in your case, what I want you to do is sometimes write, write in the comments section, write in the feed your own ideas. So I hope the weather is fine where you are. And let's begin. Okay, so uh, first thing I want to talk to you about 21st century learning skills in the ELT classroom, the four C's. Uh, this is very important for the world today and I think it's going to influence what we do on teaching. Uh, now, we live in a new world, a world where all kinds of technology is affecting everything, everything that we do. Not just in this moment, me talking to you from another country in another place, but every little thing that goes on with your students today, regardless of age, is heavily influenced by the new technology. And that's the sort of thing we should consider. So you're familiar with theory and practice, that some ideas uh, will influence what you do, but also uh, some things that will you introduce will come back to your basic ideas. It's an interactive process, and it's the kind of thing that we should all consider. Learning isn't just the concrete stuff and the abstract stuff. It's kind of a mixture of the two, and I think that's important. And another thing that's important is I want to say hi to Kyungim. Hello, hi Kyungim, and hi other people as you come in. Please say hello as we continue this event. So the first thing we want to look at about theory and practice is the push that's going on in governments and other places about 21st century skills. In 2002, a coalition of businesses, educators, and policymakers occurred where they came up with this very interesting framework about everything that might influence education to make it more with the modern era not just today, but looking ahead in the future too. That's why it's called 21st century skills. It's a more holistic approach uh, to teaching and learning and one that involves the four C's. And so a big question about this, or a big point about this, is the 21st century classroom is student-centered. Student-centered. I want you to think about that and I want to hear your ideas about that. Specifically, I want you to start typing. Start typing now. What makes a classroom student-centered? Now, I'm not looking for a right answer or wrong answer. I'm looking for something more important, your answer. So uh, give yourselves about a minute. Start typing now. Have fun with the typing and write down your answers. What makes a classroom student-centered? So pick up your fingers and move. I'm not going to talk about your grammar. I'm not going to talk about your spelling. I'm going to talk about your ideas, and I want you to share your ideas with kyung -im, with Tom, and other people that are participating. So give yourselves one minute. And while you're doing that, I want to tell a story. Uh, when I first came to Korea, one of the things that I did was teaching at a kindergarten. And for some reason, I didn't have my materials, so I taught my clothes. I just walked in, and I taught my shirt, my shoes, pants, things like that. That was one 25-minute lesson that happened with my clothes. And I walked out of the classroom thinking, oh, I just only taught men's clothes. And then I realized, wait a minute, I have to teach women's clothes too. I have to be fair and impartial and neutral. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I taught men's clothes by wearing them into the kindergarten classroom. 
So what am I going to do now? And I realized, oh man, I have to wear women's clothes <laughs> in the next classroom. So what I did was I walked into the classroom wearing women's clothes. Uh, and the women, and it was kind of fun. The, the, the Korean kindergarten teachers that were watching me thought it was hilarious. So uh, that's some things you have to do when you're teaching. Sometimes you have to go a little bit farther than what's expected of you just to be logical and step by step. Okay, I'll give you about 38 more seconds because these are fun. Already we're seeing from Kyungim, related activities giving chances to participate. That is an excellent approach to a student-centered classroom. Shifting the focus from the teacher and the students to build independent learning. That's from our friend Tom King, uh, Tom Kim. And that is a very creative idea that, uh, that is important for raising their own independence. Independence is one of my favorite words. It's actually in my teacher's philosophy, so thank you, Tom. Other ideas, keep them coming, ladies and gentlemen. Victor, I want to say hello to Victor on the chat. Hello to Rachel, Sana on the chat, and other people as they come in. You'll realize that sometimes this kind of interactivity is important, not just for students, but for teachers as well. It's a modern world, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, with those ideas, and keep your ideas coming. I want to share a few of them that are about the difference between student-centered and teacher-centered. So for example, this shift in instructional approach, the teacher-centered approach, is direct instruction, standing up and talking with you, formal authority, I know what's going on, there's a subject expert, that's helpful, and the teacher's something of a model, not a fashion model, but a model for how to use the language or for how to learn or something. And that's fine and that's good. I'm not necessarily against teacher-centered approaches. I've done them myself. But in the modern era where independence occurs more and more, we need to move to a student-centered approach. And that can involve inquiry-based learning, uh, asking questions, basically, and cooperative learning, bouncing ideas, principles, and communications off each other. There, the teacher is a facilitator, kind of a conductor that moves the instruments around and a delegator. You don't have all the responsibility. You might delegate responsibility to other people. And that brings us to specifically the teacher as a facilitator of learning. And there are four things we can pick in. These are just an incomplete list. Create interesting, manageable tasks or projects that build skills. That's a little bit about the independence Tom was discussing. Provide a safe and supportive environment and necessary tools. That's making sure that there's an atmosphere uh, that's positive for learning. Give the right kind of level of support at the right time. Not too much where they're bored and they go, teacher, I know this, or too little where they go, teacher, I don't know what's going on. And provide guidance and constructive feedback. The word constructive is important. We don't just rip apart the ideas that people have. No, we support and we make sure that what we say does benefit their changes. So of course the 21st century classroom is going to be flexible. And in its flexibility, it'll be different from the traditional classroom layout. There's the teacher up front, there are students in back. It's a bit more theatrical in some ways. But we can move on to something more modular, something more involved. And some of you that are teaching in this model have the 21st century classroom layout. The teacher isn't always up front. Sometimes it's great to have a clicker and to be in back, so where the student is in the middle of the learning, rather at the end of the learning. Uh, it's important to have students talk with each other, pair work, group work, and all those other things. And that's what makes this layout, this kind of, uh, this kind of sort of group circular layout, more interesting in a lot of teaching circumstances. So the 21st century classroom teaches learning skills, uh, and those skills will matter. Now, what learning skills? Well, this isn't just for uh, Kung Im, Tom, and the others coming in. It's also for Carolina who signed in. So hi, Carolina. Everyone, feel free to type back and say hello. That's always great, because we're learning more about those skills. And those four C's, as we heard before, 
are critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity. And you'll notice that they're interactive, that they kind of work with each other. And in creating interactivity, some things are at the center. Creativity kind of pops up. That's what human beings do. We make tools in order to hunt, you know, in prehistoric times. Making things is our business as this great species that we are. So it's more humanistic and it gets back to our identity. So I want to focus on the first one, which is critical thinking. You could kind of guess what that's about. Uh, critical thinking involves reasoning effectively, involves making judgments and decisions, involves solving problems, and also involves saying hello. Lara, hello, welcome to the, welcome to the chat. Uh, but I want to break down critical thinking a little bit detailed. And this is going to get a little philosophical. So I hope you're ready for a little bit of philosophy. Because there are different structures for how we go through ideas and interact with those ideas. The first structure is called deductive reasoning. That'll start with the basic theory that you have, move to observation where we see other people doing things. We connect, we make a hypothesis about that theory and how it connects to that person. And we try to confirm that it's true. They confirm is sort of look and see and check. And what does that mean? How can we apply this? Well, we do this all the time. This isn't just for our classes. If you're walking around, you might think, well, all women that are married have a wedding ring. You might have that as a principle. And you might walk around and you'll see, well, she's wearing a wedding ring. She's, therefore, she's married. You might make that conclusion. Whether it's totally 100% correct or not, it's part of the deductive process. Of course, there's going to be exceptions. There's going to be all kinds of things. But that kind of reasoning, that deductive reasoning that Aristoteles and others talked about, that's part of what we teach students. But because sometimes the wedding ring doesn't mean marriage and sometimes other examples don't pan out, it's important for us to look at reality and see what the principles really are. And that process is called inductive reasoning. It goes the other direction. Here we start with observation. We might see a pattern in what we see, and then we form a hypothesis, a theory about what it is that's true about these objects or entities or relationships or behaviors. And then we put the theory forward as to what that means. So the classic example that they always give in philosophy class is, of course, swans. So you haven't, you don't know this word, maybe you don't know this concept, but you see this bird and this bird and this bird and this bird, and you see there's some similarities of what they're doing, and you come to the conclusion that swans are white, and that becomes your canon about what a swan is. Of course, and again, from philosophy class, they always come up with the black swan. Sometimes, your inductive general statements don't work out so well. And those uh, require a little bit of checking. Sometimes it means uh, double checking your reasoning and discovering, okay, uh, maybe there's another aspect to swans than just having uh, white feathers. And that process might involve something a little bit different. And we call that abductive reasoning. Isn't that cool? That's from the 19th century, C.S. Peirce, I believe. And inductive reasoning is a little bit different. You have incomplete information. And you take that incomplete information and you, you juggle with the known theories that you have. And from that information, what you're seeing or observing, you come up with the best possible hypothesis or explanation. And then you try to confirm the hypothesis. You try to find out if it's true or not. So let's say you're in a room and you see a little girl, she's blowing her nose. You might have a few theories as to what that involves, right? Uh, those theories can be something like this. Uh, maybe she's sick, maybe she, has, uh, maybe she has a cold, maybe she has some kind of allergy. There's all these different kinds of theories and you might, you might come up with a few and then check with her or check with her parents to see what the case is. So we do this all the time in order to figure things out. But of course, there's something else called analogical reasoning. 
and that uses known theories about the subject that you're thinking about. And noticing that X is similar to Y in some ways. There's some kind of balance between the two. There's some similarities. So you hypothesize, you think, maybe there's a connection there, there's similarities. Maybe they belong together somehow, and you try to confirm it. And we do this naturally. Uh, so we might see a picture of a brown bear, a black bear, and a polar bear, and see some similarities, and we might analogize. We might think an analogously that a panda is a bear too. We typically say that, panda bear. And yes, we can identify similarities, but you have to be careful. Technically speaking, a panda is not a bear, but it's very understandable why people do that. Uh, some non-bears on the chat. We also have Marisol Ladino. Hello, Marisol. And Compass Publishing is saying hello, too. Aren't we lovely? So let's move on. Now, let's summarize as we move on. Deductive is from the general to the specific. Inductive is from the specific to the general. Abductive, isn't that a nice word? Is from incomplete information to maybe your best guess. And analogical reasoning is from accepted similarities and maybe other similarities to help us learn more about these things. Now, maybe you won't go into a class of elementary schoolers and say deductive, inductive, abductive, analogical. Maybe you'd explain it more in a scaffolded, structured way. Maybe you'd use their own kind of language. Maybe you'd simplify things. But it's important to keep in mind because, and it's important to notice in your students so that you can see where they are on their critical thinking skills with regard to reasoning. Now, reasoning isn't just how we get from one idea to another. It's also the rules of how we do that, logic. And logic is something to point out to students, too. And so sometimes we make contradictions and we need to say, well, contradictions can exist, we need to remove them. Sometimes it's harder to find contradictions because there's so many things that we use as illogical thinking. And we call those things fallacies. Fallacies are mistakes in going in our reasoning. And that, and you've probably seen a lot of these. If you follow the news, if you follow conversations with other people, if you're at a party, all kinds of fallacies can occur inside yourself and inside others. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself. One fallacy is the ad hominem fallacy. I don't agree with that because the person who said it is an idiot, man. You know, you know, the truth doesn't depend on what you feel about something. It depends what the actual truth is. There's also false causality. It always rains when I don't have my umbrella. <laughs> it's kind of the other way, isn't it? So your causation, your sense of cause and effect will be different based on this kind of fallacious reasoning. It's important to point these things out too. And that'll raise smarter, more rational, more critical thinking abled students. Now another aspect of critical thinking is making judgments and decisions. We are inundated. We are flooded with all kinds of pictures, images, sources, videos. Everything is just attacking us. And when it attacks us, we have to make decisions based on all this information. We have to separate things out and we have to think step by step, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? So an aspect of making judgments and decisions is, can be uh, brought down to evaluating evidence arguments, claims, and beliefs. By looking at these things, we have a better understanding of what needs to be done. And there's three important words we can use for that. Huh? And that means, is it understandable? Is it confusing? Is it vague? Do we have an understanding of where we are in our knowledge? Is the status of knowledge clear? Another one is, really? And that's a way of asking, is it factually true? Is it logical? Uh, is there evidence for that? And that's important. We don't want to just take things on faith. We want to confirm them. So let's say you go, huh? Really? Then you get to so. Uh, why does it matter? Yeah, so, but maybe it's not important. Or to whom does it matter? Or how much uh, importance is attached to it? 
So these are simple things to ask. Another way of taking with your students and scaffolding it so that early on you can develop critical thinking in their skills. So when we're doing those kinds of things, that gets us ready for solving problems. Don't be afraid. Solving problems is where the fun happens, right? Because now we come up with solutions using few techniques. And one technique can be called define, ideate, evaluate, and implement. Now what does that mean? Well, when we define, we say, is there a problem? What is it exactly? We try to specify what the problem is. Ideate, we try to come up with ideas for those, uh, for those. Some of them will be horrible, some of them will be good. Maybe just one of them will be good. Maybe none of them will be good, but we try to come up with these ideas. Uh, evaluate. We look at the ideas. We don't evaluate while we're coming up with ideas. That's for later. We want to give ourselves freedom to come up with the ideas in the moment, which is why we separate these steps. And we evaluate the ideas. Maybe one of them is very good, then we implement. Implement means we put it into practice. How do we put it into practice? Well, we, we ask, does it solve the problem? How can we do it? And other things like that. Uh, and I want to say hi to V, uh, v Sun, Sunesp. Love that name. Oh, Pile Espinoza uh, in Sina. Oh, I, sorry, my pronunciation is horrible. In Sinaloa, Mexico. Well, hello, uh, Pili. Welcome to the chat. We're having fun, so let's keep going. By the way, anything you want to write and put in the chat, please do. We always like your interaction, and it's part of doing this in a 21st century way. Okay, now I want to turn to a different category. Two categories, in fact, but I think it's better to treat them together. And that we can refer to as creativity and collaboration. Creativity and collaboration. Uh, and I want to ask you another question. For those of you that are coming into the chat, you're going to have a chance to write answers to the question. And this time, I think I'll give people maybe two minutes to answer the, the chat questions. Okay, so I want to jump into the first one, which is creativity. Now, we define creativity as the ability to make something novel or useful. Now, by novel, we mean new. We mean inventive in that sense. So what does that require? Well, we have to think creatively. That means we have to think in ways that reach novel or useful ideas. We have to work creatively with others. We can't just say yes and go on with it. We have to bounce off and connect. And we have to put these into practice. Why are we being creative? So we can live and apply our creative ideas. Not just being creative for creativity's sake, right? And so that's going to be important. Now I want you to think, and I want you to answer very soon about this question. This question doesn't have an official answer. Feel free to start typing if you want. It doesn't have a 100% guaranteed answer, but it does have your answer. And it's important to think about uh, so that you have a better sense of your own ideas. And that is this. How can we make our students more creative? I repeat, how can we make our students more creative? It's a good question. I have my ideas, but your ideas might actually be, your my ideas might actually be better than mine. So embarrass me if you like. Write down your answers, any answers. And I'm going to give you, it says one minute, I'll probably give you two. And I think in the process of doing that, I'll keep talking. So just keep talk, don't keep writing. Don't worry about spelling, grammar, punctuation, or even intelligence. Just get it out. We're ideating, as we described earlier, right? We can evaluate these later. So we get to apply our critical thinking skills as we're writing these. So how can our students, uh, how can we make our students more creative? It's interesting because for me, I've had a lot of my own creative stuff in my life. I've had to perform, I've had to, I've had to come up with my own lessons, I've had to come up with my own ideas for lessons, I've had to design handouts, design other pieces of paper, uh, I've had to write scripts, 
Last week at my university, I wrote a script uh, and it was well received. And it's the kind of thing that's not just about students, but about yourself, knowing your own ideas and who you are and pushing yourself to come up with ideas. Uh, I've had to write stand-up comedy, bad stand-up comedy, but stand-up comedy. And, in the, and that kind of pushes you. Sometimes I think all teachers should try a little bit of public speaking because that by itself is teacher development. I personally try um, my own uh, public speaking. I'm a member of Toastmasters, which is all around, and even in Mexico too, all around the world. Those are good opportunities for teacher development. Creativity is part of everyone's job. Well, it looks like a few people are coming in. Victor is saying, ask questions that have more than one answer. Yes, a lot of open-ended questions. Carolina Salazar, developing projects, providing opportunities to the classroom and make mistakes and not be penalized. Yes, we want to make sure that our kids, our students, our adults, whoever they are, come up with ideas. I call all students kids even students older than me. Uh, do various activities. Yes, if we're just the same note, one activity again and again and again, it's gonna realize problems. Thank you, Lara. Carolina has a homework that can be presented in a wide variety of materials. Yes, that pushes you out. Not always the essay about uh, how you spent your summer vacation or, if, or this hand or that hand. Some kind of difference. Maybe they make something, maybe they build something all kinds of things like that. Not giving them the answers, letting them be free about topics and projects. Yes, in the sense that's what I'm trying to do here. I don't want to tell you what the official answers are. In fact, some of the official people may not agree too much about how to do those officially. Uh, so it's important to get ideas out there. And sometimes the people that are not the experts are the people that change things for the better including you and including your students. So thank you, Oscar, for those. So uh, let's continue with some of these ideas. And one thing that's important in creativity is setting limits and boundaries. People think that creativity is about complete freedom. Not exactly. Complete freedom is overwhelming and ineffective developing skills. If you give people crayons and say, use crayons, that's not, there's no boundaries there. But if you give them and say, draw some kind of thing like this, draw an animal that you want to be someday, if you could change into an animal, or something like that. Teachers must set aims and boundaries within which to innovate. And sometimes time does that, sometimes having limits to what the procedures are does that. So that's very important to set limits and boundaries. Every creative thing, uh, requires limits. Limits focus what you do and focus what you make and and when you do that and when you make that you're more able. You have to think of creativity as almost like a game. Games aren't just people running around being crazy. Games have rules, they have limits and that's what makes the game fun and that's what makes creativity fun too. Another aspect about creativity is saying yes and. This is an interesting concept. Yes, that's a picture of me in there. There's a kind of acting I do called improv or improvisational theater. This is acting with no script. You get the ideas from the audience and boom, you have to do something. How do you do something like that? Well, one of the rules that improvisers talk about is saying yes and. And a lot of books on creativity point out yes and as a principle. What is yes and? Well, it's well when you hear an idea or when you hear a situation, first accept it and then so you say yes to it. So look at the picture. Uh, there's this uh, Korean man on the left. He's walking up to me or no, no, uh, focus on me. I'm making something and he might notice that I'm making something and he might say something like, oh, your pizza's going to look great. Right? He's saying yes to my idea and he's giving more information. But then build on the same idea by adding a related concept using and. And so he said, you're making a pizza. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say yes and to his idea. And I'm going to say something like, for example, yes, 
the pepperoni that we got this morning is delicious. And that yes and, yes and, yes and, yes and, yes and, it kind of builds. It's almost like making Jenga, taking a piece out and putting it somewhere. That in a large part is what creativity is. Taking an idea, believing in an idea, adding to the idea. And I think that's encouraging for people. So uh, another thing to consider is know when to use the right voice. Um, nobody's 100% mentally healthy. We all have our own little twists and turns. And we all have different voices inside of our head. So a creative person can think of creativity as having three voices. The dreamer, the realist, and the critic. The dreamer is the wild one, the animal that comes up with all these ideas. Dreams up ideas, something impractical or even crazy. The realist says, well, how could we... How could we focus that? How can we structure that? That's the more linear approach that makes things more, how can I say, more focused and more directed. And the realist makes things happen. Sounds like a great idea, let's try this. Sounds like a great idea, let's try that. Now the critic is there too. And the critic says, but. And it's fine to say but farther down the line. Not just and, but a little bit of but. And that person evaluates ideas refines ideas. Each voice has a use at different times and balancing those are important. Now one example of balancing of that is the six thinking hats approach by Edward de Bono. Edward de Bono is this uh, creativity guy. He wrote a book called Lateral Thinking. He also wrote another book called Six Thinking Hats and this breaks it down even more and I'm not going to go too much into this particular slide so just remember the phrase six thinking hats and phrases like cautions, feelings, creativity, uh, uh, facts, those kinds of things. What does that do? Well, that gives us a sense that at different points in time we need different foci, focuses, in order to develop our sense of what we are creating. So that's a kind of creativity tool, right? Having six thinking hats. Another kind of creativity tool to use is, of course, mind mapping. Mind mapping is very important. It's one concept. Uh, there are different people that have different views about it, but you've probably used it in the class. It's sometimes used for listening activities, used for reading activities, but can also be used for creative activities too. So it's a great tool to get things going and to see interrelationships between ideas. Now, those aren't the other ones. Uh, there's all kinds. This is a flood of things and it, you, if you have a photographic memory take it in if you want but I think it's better just for you to get online Google the concept of creativity tools and you'll get floods like this. You have got things like a creative hit list, things of concept triangle, purpose, um, fixed point. Um, you'll get ideas such as using the five W's, who, what, when, where, why, how, etc. The, so there's a multitude, a huge grouping of all these ideas out there that are worth considering. Okay, a fifth principle of creativity is to engage both reason and emotion. This is why critical thinking matters to creativity, but we want to be motivational. We want to connect with students. Uh, give you an example from my own experience. Uh, last summer, I was teaching, what's it called? I was teaching teenage students from Russia and other countries in Korea. Uh, and it occurred to me that these students, they're very interested in love and romance, so it's a very valid topic for them. So I made a lesson on how to do pickup lines <laughs> in English, and they loved it. It's kind of funny lesson. And it's a skill to write these things. And the idea is, it isn't so much that they will go out in the world and use these. The idea was to engage them emotionally in some kind of writing or some kind of creativity. And this is something that matters to them. They're all interested in uh, grow, uh, growing up, becoming adult, and getting into relationships. Um, they all had their own opinions. Some, some of them hated the idea, some of them loved the idea, but emotion was in play with a skill that I was willing to teach them that did involve creativity. 
So we want to connect emotion and reason. You want to get a sense of where your students feel or what they would appreciate on an emotional level. Uh, so if you can build that into creative tasks, that's very helpful. Boom. So let's break those down, those five helpful tips. And those five helpful tips are set limits, say yes and, know when to use the right voice, use creativity tools, engage both reason and emotion. So I would, I would put that somewhere on your desk just to keep yourself going as a teacher. Let's continue. And now let's turn to collaboration. This is where we work with others to achieve a goal. Notice you're not just working, you're not just getting things, you're not just getting things done. There's a specific goal involved and that's important to specify. We want to be flexible and open. So we want people to be able to offer ideas. You can even scaffold this. You can explain this. You can put a poster and say, how about, jum, 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 dot, dot, dot. What if we, uh, maybe we should say, little phrases like that you can make into a poster and put on your classroom wall so that students know how to collaborate and how to get openness out of each other. It's important to share group responsibility in the collaborative process. We don't want one person doing all the work and other people just kind of doing nothing. We don't want one person overpowering another. It's not a master-slave relationship. It's more of a trading relationship. And we want to value contributions of each member. That's interesting. You've probably noticed this with your own students. Some of the quieter students will chime in the most interesting points and you'll be very pleased. You might tell your spouse about it when you get home. Oh, Billy said this. Really, Billy? Oh, that's great. And so we want to value contributions even from the lower proficiency students or other things like that. So that's par, par for the course. That's basic principles of what collaboration involves. And another aspect uh, to consider is group work. This is going to be another one minute activity. Why do some teachers avoid student group work? What's the worry? What's the concern? Why would they go? They'd start making activity. Oh, make it a group. But, but what? Why would this get in the way of them coming up with these activities? I want you to write down your answers. Uh, give yourself a minute. Feel free to come up with anything. And as always, we're, we're, in, uh, we're ideating. We're coming up with ideas as they come. We're not concerned about how true or false they are. We're not kind of worried about grammar, punctuation, style, etc. We want to come up with these ideas as soon as possible. And that should be, that should be worthwhile uh, for you and for other teachers. So a few things to note. Uh, Etiquette. Oh, welcome, Etiquette. Glad you're here. Uh, says, I like the idea of teaching pickup lines. Other students enjoy it. It's not something they'll learn in traditional classrooms and they get the practice with each other. Yes, not just that topic, but other topics too. Think about what your students are interested in. And something like pickup lines or any kind of structure or genre, break it down, figure out what the components are and teach, and teach the nature of those components to your students. Then they can put it together. So lack of planning and risk of misbehavior. That could be a problem with group work. Uh, and that risk is what kind of gets people hesitant about grouping students. Class gets noisy. Ah, oh, yes. Sometimes we teachers want our piece of quiet. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Victor. Some schools still appreciate silent classrooms. That's true. There is a role for silence. Maria Montessori, uh, the great ed Italian educator, she had an interesting uh, um, activity involving silence. John Edwards, group work can easily get chaotic. Chaotic, lack of order, things go all over the place. It could be a madhouse, right? That could be scary. Carolina says, yes, Vic, it requires more lesson planning materials. Yeah, it's work. And, you know, sometimes we want to back off work a little bit. That can definitely be a concern. So uh, because they lose control of the class, they usually relate group work. This is Oscar speaking. 
They usually relate group work with talking, shouting, and speaking without knowing what is really happening in every spot of the class. In every spot of the class, yeah. So you kind of have to structure group work so it's a little less chaotic. You have to break down goals, maybe one in three steps,、uh, so that they get to a hoop, then they get to another hoop, then they get to another hoop, and they jump through each hoop. And maybe in that process is them trying to. Trying to meet the game of your goals, they're more able to control themselves and focus on what they need to do. Carolina、uh, mentions that sometimes teachers don't know tools to evaluate teamwork. Yeah, yeah, you might be only looking at just the grammatical or lexical production of your students. You might be looking at just behavior. You have to monitor different aspects. Are they on task? Uh, are they balanced in what they're doing? Are they doing the right thing?、Uh, what kind of ideas are contributing? What kind of things can you can contribute? All these questions. But part of the part of the fun of teaching is the dance of monitoring and seeing how they're doing and enjoying them struggling with accomplishing a challenging goal. Criteria, yes, for Gamer. Victor is chiming in on that also. So I don't want to leave you too much in suspense. Let so、uh, if not managed well, group work can be difficult to control. That's the chaotic that John and others pointed out.、It、can be noisy. <laughs> That's something Carolina pointed out. Students get off task easily. Yes, if it sprawls, that can be a problem, and it can be difficult to assess.、Uh, and that's something that brought that Carolina brought in. So those issues can be a problem. How do we deal with those issues? Well, here are some ideas. It's not a complete list. You might have more ideas yourself. So these are tips for helpful collaboration. We want to keep groups small, four or fewer people. Five, six, seven becomes a little too much to juggle. We want to clearly define objectives, procedure, and assessment at the beginning, and check understanding. So you can even give hints as to、uh, the kind of thing they want to produce, and little tools for how to produce it. We want to assign roles to each student. Now that that could be a chairperson for the group, a note taker. Note taker is good for some of those students that are a little bit afraid to speak. But you've noticed this sometimes. Some of the students that are afraid to speak are better at writing, are better at saying things in the written word, and a presenter, someone to get up front. And sometimes you have to choose based on where the strengths and weaknesses lie. And people strong in one area, you give to other things. That way, you don't have that one student that's a star in everything, doing everything. We want to make sure that it is genuinely collaborative. We want to choose tasks that offer suitable challenge and complexity. When I first started doing my student teaching at a high school in Kansas City. I gave a project, and one of the students was going, "This is dumb." <laughs> it wasn't challenging for her, or she thought it wasn't important for her. So we want to give something a challenge where at least they furrow their brow like this a little bit, not totally give up furrow. And we want to af- offer scaffolding for weaker students. We want to help out those weaker students and give them something that kind of, you know, moves on. Why don't you try this, or maybe this idea, or what if? You can give hints like that and phrase it in terms of it's not my idea. I'm just wondering what you think about this idea. So these are some helpful tips for collaboration. You probably come up with a few others. You've probably developed a few others in some of your other classrooms, but it's important to flag, remember, and move on as we go to the topic of communication. This is kind of the goal of what we had in mind. In English teaching, or in any kind of other language teaching or presentation teaching, so communication is important. We want to articulate thoughts effectively. So the question is, what is articulation? We want to listen to others, and how do we listen? Is it just ears on? Is there something more active going on? We want a variety of aims and audiences. We're not teaching students to teach them how to write just for the teacher. We're teaching them how to deal with the real world outside of the classroom, and we want to ask how can we bring media and technology in because 
It is, after all, the 21st century, and these things are becoming more and more important. So, articulating thoughts effectively. One system is called CI. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. Just want you to remember the phrase CI, S E hyphen I. Again, you can find this online. And the S in C means state. That means say what you have to say, basically. That can kind of start a paragraph. Elaborate, that means go on with greater work. In other words, so can you restate it in a different way? Exemplify, now we want to make it more concrete and more specific. We've explained it two different ways. Now let's be more reality focused or concrete focused. For example, or to give you an, to give you an example, any of those phrases. And illustrate might wrap things up. It's a little bit more flexible. It's like, and that might be a metaphor, that might be an analogy, that might be a way, a, a related concept. It could be all kinds of things. So those four in CI, that's one way to make thoughts uh, effective, to make it articulate. And keep in mind the difference. It goes back to critical thinking. We want concretes and abstractions together. That's the definition of clarity for certain thinkers. Another aspect is listening to others. Gotta say, this is my weak area. And I've learned through other fields how to be stronger as a listener. Uh, so, um, for example, uh, we want to communicate. We want to, when we communicate, when we listen, we want to pay attention and connect. We want to look interested, nod, and other things. We want to paraphrase. So what you're saying is, that's a, that's a rule of listening. If you can't summarize what the other people said, did you really listen? Now that's an important. Listening is an active process. It's not waiting for sound to hit the ears. We want to reflect feelings. For a lot of people, what they're saying isn't important. It's the feelings behind them that's important. It's not the melody, it's the chords. For a lot of people, the chords of the song are what the, the actual communication is about. You sound upset, you sound, you sound happy, you seem those kinds of things. I want to summarize. So overall, it seems, so we've decided that that's especially good in the group things. So uh, I want to uh, acknowledge other people in the chat room. Soy uh, Pisse, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. My apologies if not. Hello. Uh, also hello to, um, oh yeah, um, somebody from Thailand. Oh, some kid Krob. Yes, hello from Thailand. So this is very international. Let's keep up the chatting. Everyone, feel free to say hello. Feel free to say hi to each other. Feel free to do whatever you like, and let's continue with the listening. And that's this. Communication skills in the classroom need to stress that we need to have a variety of aims, that means objectives and goals and audiences. Uh, so we want to maximize chances for output. So that means speaking, writing, that means pair groupings, uh, those kinds of things. And we also want di different formats of writing and speaking, different genres of writing and speaking, um, digital, traditional kinds of communication. 21st century, paper's not going away. The uh, old-fashioned stuff's not going away. That stuff still has a very strong role in the classroom. And we want something called authenticity. Authenticity means it's a real world, real connected kind of thing that maybe it's genuine communication and not just an example of what you might do in the real world. Maybe what they're communicating is connected to the real world. We'll talk about that briefly. Uh, okay, so let's focus on speaking for the moment. We want interaction and we want conversation, informal discussion. We want interviews, kinds of things. That's a more of one-on-one -on -one kind of process. But there's another kind of process that's product production. And that means like standing up, giving a speech, describing an experience, giving instructions, addressing an audience, a uh, public service announcement. Uh, that's another thing I've taught. Uh, how to do a commercial. 
Are you tired of writing every day with pencils? Do pencils slow you down? Do your hands feel bad writing in pencils? Well, no more. Now with pen, you can. And there's a structure to how people do commercials. And I've taught that to students and a wide variety of students. And so uh, production activities, again, can be creative, can involve logical thinking, uh, critical thinking, and is definitely a communicative activity. So um, you have to think about the usual teacher-student interaction model in the classroom and visualize what that means. Typically, it's something like teacher initiates something, students respond, and feedback. It's going to look a little like ping pong, right? And that's fine, but that's not entirely the model we want to consider how the teacher interacts with the students. For one thing, it's not that authentic. It's very structured. What do you think, Billy? What do you think, Billy? What do you think, Billy? We don't often say, what do you think, Billy, in the classroom. Teacher's always in control. There's tight reins that the teacher has on the student. We want to be able to back away, give the student room to breathe, and give the student room to create. And so other methods are follow-up questions. So, what did, uh, so if you do that, then what about this? Or casual conversation. How are things going in your school? Uh, what are you doing? Um, what's your project? What happened on the weekend? All those kinds of things loosen things up. So the teacher shouldn't have just that simple kind of back and forth in ping pong or table tennis. The teacher should also have these looser structures. And there are these different kinds of structures that are involved. We have basic presentation in front of the room, one-on-one -on -one interview. So tell me more about your situation. Students can design a, students can design a character and uh, write down the notes of the character, and someone can interview that character, and your student can speak from the point of view of that character. Uh, group discussion can be a, uh, is an important model. Pair work or teamwork is definitely something to consider. Of course, thinking is primarily an individual process, but in pair work, teamwork, you're putting individuals together and you're getting these other kinds of things. Role play, where they assume a character. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of role play because role play, you have to bring in these other genres, you have to bring in other knowledge, you have to bring in stuff that the teacher will not expect. You want to bring surprises to you from your students. And formal debate, where two groups are going. Um, sometimes in Korea, this it's hard to do formal debate because students want to be on the same side. So one thing I do is I have them write down where they stand on a particular issue, and then I group them according to where they stand, or you group them according to the opposite of where they stand as an exercise. So these aren't the only structures. Uh, there's a person named Kaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N, that's worth considering. Uh, Soy, oh, you're in Cambodia. Oh, cool. OK. The internationality just keeps growing and growing. So Kaplan, like I said, K-A-P-L-A-N. Kaplan's cooperative structures are an interesting thing to look up. I think he has about seven or eight of them. Uh, different ways to arrange people in the classroom beyond this. Again, that's Kaplan Cooperative Learning Structures. Boom. Okay, writing. Another aspect of communication. Well, writing has to be a variety of genres and purposes, not just your basic essay uh, or your basic paragraph. We want to establish personal and emotional expression in there. That means, what does this person think? If you think about your own writing, I studied English, and my writing in college, when I got my English degree, was kind of stiff. And only after I graduated, when I was writing for real audiences, did my writing become something strong. And that's important to consider. Um, real communication, not copying models, not practicing grammar. Of course, it's important to give them tools from the language to help them, but we should also consider uh, that the audience is what's really going to motivate them, getting their message across. And reading passages uh, uh, that they can get 
uh, that don't, uh, not to model for writing, but that might create ideas. So if we give them something to read, that's good. I recently taught a lesson on rats <laughs> because it's now the year of the rat in, in uh, the Lunar New Year system. And I thought, well, let's teach rats. I've never taught rats before. And I gave them something and it, and it sparked ideas, but it wasn't meant as a model for what they want to write. So that's a good way of getting their creativity going. So again, same thing as with speaking, interaction and production. Remember these two. Interactive models of writing are notes pass back and forth, uh, forms, da da da. Okay, I see you had a job here that involved a lot of uh, cooking pizza. Yes, sir, I did. Okay, those are some aspects, but production is what we normally think of with writing. But notice that there's two different kinds. So creative writing, articles, instruction manuals, recipes, tickets. Again, the writing can be very short, very small. Uh, hi, Sun Juan on the chat. Good to see you also. So you see, uh, again, the same kind of model between interaction and production. So um, media and technology, that's going to matter for communication. And you know all those kinds, social media, commenting on videos, video chatting, blogging, collaborative document creation, you know, on a Google form or whatever the, whatever the platform is. We're not married to any platform. Um, opportunities for interaction with native speakers or non-native speakers. Uh, in this class, it could be someone from Europe or someone from Asia that they're speaking English with, right? It doesn't have to be entirely native. Uh, so it's important that we connect with these kind of different audiences. You can bring people in to talk about stuff. There's all kinds of things going on in the world, quite possibly, that can be uh, made available on Skype or on Zoom or on these other platforms for interactive communication across long distances. Nowadays, I'm doing meetings using Zoom so that we can all do meetings while we're sitting at home. And it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. So it'll, in, and that possibly involves bringing people from international places. Okay, let me backspace a bit. There we go. Let me forward space. Ah, and that brings us to one tool that we can consider. New Frontiers. That's an offered here from Compass Publishing. And it's a course for teens. It goes from beginner to upper intermediate. And it's the kind of book that brings in these four C's uh, for 21st century learning skills. It's a, it's a series, six books for secondary uh, learners, uh, secondary school learners. So grades six through 12, I'm not sure how many grades you have in these other countries. In the United States and Korea, they tend to do 12 grades. I've heard of 10, I've heard of 11. So whatever the case may be. And it's leveled using the European Common Framework, A1, A1+, A2, B1, B1+, B2. You can look up uh, the European Common Framework as a structure for what different people different students need at different levels of proficiency. If they get these skills um, and they go to these skills, then maybe they're at A2, they get more skills, they can go to B2. Hold on. A little, little technology going on there. Uh, features to consider uh, in this series of textbooks. There's 10 unit structure of lessons connected by themes and goals. These might be some of the things like family, these might be something like weather, etc. cetera. Uh, they balance input and output. There's a lot of things to promote thinking, uh, texts uh, to read, listening and reading. Um, also, there's a clear focus on building CEFR, that is the European Common Framework uh, competencies going up and up and up. You can even see it in just the headings that they give in the textbook. And they're thematically linked. So each unit has a theme. And there's a project at the end meant to build at least two 
of those, of those uh, 21st century learning skills. And they'll vary it sometimes. Sometimes it's creativity, sometimes it's collaboration together, sometimes it's collaboration and critical thinking, sometimes it's critical thinking and communication. Different things can balance there. So that gives them an idea of the kind of skills they're going to need. And it's bold, it's colorful, it's got some entertaining aspects to it also. Uh, and here's an idea of what it's going to look like. You notice, uh, look on the skill, it says 21st century skills. It's got two, you'll notice these little orange, there's an orange and a pink box that says, let me look a little bit closely, yeah, communication and collaboration. And those tell us uh, the fo foci that we need for what's going on. You know, it's a little bit of cuteness going on for students. Everyone likes cuteness. I don't know anybody that's against cuteness. And so to sum up there, we have your common European framework competencies, the 21st century skills we've talked about today, project-based learning. Again, that brings in all these different sources. Um, communicative approach. We want people speaking. We want people receiving information. We want people explaining information. We want people expanding information. We want an audience to be connected to that student. And balanced language skills. Uh, there is a tension to focus on form, uh, to language aspects, as a means of communicating, not as an end in itself. And that's it. Any questions that you have? Again, I'd, I'd be very curious to hear what kind of questions you might have for this kind of operation. Uh, as, so as you're typing, and it takes about, it could take one or two minutes, uh, keep in mind those skills. Collaboration. We want, we want people working together to come up with a product. Communication, we want ideas expressed outward. Where do ideas come from? You can't communicate ideas if you don't have ideas. That means critical thinking skills, being able to observe the world, uh, come to conclusions, expand, solve problems. Uh, that will also mean taking uh, those problem solving ideas, transforming them into creativity ideas that we can use to deal with the world out there. So those are the kinds of things to consider uh, when you're coming up with lessons. And uh, with whatever you choose, with whatever tool you use, uh, that's what we should think about as we go on in our own teaching. So I hope you had a wonderful time here in learning from this process. Think of your own ideas. Feel free when you see these videos, you might see these videos again in some other format. Feel free to confront the video. Feel free to wait a minute. Feel free to question, criticize if you like, because that can only be beneficial for you and especially for your students to expand the ideas and to grow with them and to see what is possible with your students as you expand into the 21st century with 21st century learning skills. And with that, I want to say thank you for participating from all the countries you're at, from all the things you had to say, from the ideas you pr provided. I was very happy to do this. I'm looking forward to doing this again. I'm looking forward to all of you joining later things that Compass Publishing and others are offering for this discussion. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep expanding on everything else. And I hope all the best for you and your students. Thank you very much.